Last spring, uh, Teresa and Jamalet and I went to the Iowa International Education Conference, and that's where I heard Joshua V. Barr. He is the Director of Human and Civil Rights for the City of Des Moines, and at our conference he spoke about the importance of getting some kind of international experience. Since I knew I was going to do something for International Education, this, edu international education Week this year, I thought he would be the perfect kickoff to the week. So I'm going to, because I know he's going to do some introduction of himself within the presentation, I'm going to let him take over from here. All right. So uh, I'm going to try this a few different ways. But uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. How's the food? Good. All right. What, what, what's, the, what's the best thing? What's, what, what was your favorite thing? Yeah, with, with Coco? Like, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> so we'll cut this on real quick. All right. All right, so today I'm here to really talk about this uh, presentation is entitled International Education Takes You Higher. But I'm not really going to talk about education, I'm going to talk about the experience within the education. So how many of y'all are from the United States, I were born, raised here, all right, so. And how many of y'all are not from the United States, all right. So w w where is this group from that's not from the United States? Uh, you guys from Brazil? OK, all right. How did y'all find y'all way to Marshalltown? <laughs> so all right. So it looks like we have a mix, and that's good. So uh, for, 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 the, for the people from not from the United States, how often do y'all travel? I mean, this is. United States and Brazil or, where, or the other country, and that's it, or you've traveled in multiple places? Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So a lot of people have some stuff. So we're going to do a quick test real quick. Vicki actually switched up and put it back in the presentation. I always keep slides at the end just in case I want to bring it back up. So. We'll take a quick test. I know y'all didn't come to take a test, but uh, like, dang. So I want y'all to, she gave you a pen and a piece of paper, so if you can put your plate down real quick. I'm sorry for y'all that, that have to do that. I do apologize, but let's just do a quick test. Uh, let's, I want you to put nine dots on the piece of paper, just like this. Nine dots. Just like that. All right. Do, we got it? You got it? The nine dots? Looks like that. We're good? All right. Now, I want you to make, I want you to connect all nine dots using four straight lines without lifting the pen or pencil from the paper. You cannot take the pen or pencil off the paper. Connect all nine dots using four straight lines without, connect, without taking your pen or pencil from off of the paper. You, can't, you cannot lift the pen or pencil off the paper. Anybody got it? Anybody got it? Oh. <laughs> All right, so y'all y'all ready to give up? Let's, cause I got cause I got to keep moving. So <laughs> he, he spent the whole hour trying to teach us how to connect dots. So. <laughs> All right, now, so if you were doing it right, it would look something like this. Now, everybody tried to stay within the dots, right? Who told y'all y'all had to do that? Who set that rule for y'all that y'all had to stay within the boxes? That you couldn't stay off the dots? Did, did I say that? No, I did not. And so today, if you really want to get somewhere in life, you got to think outside the box. And so today, we're really going to focus on thinking outside the box. 
And I believe an international experience, connecting with different cultures and different people, can really help you to achieve your goal of, by thinking outside the box and looking at things in a different way. So, about me, uh, my name is Joshua V. Barr. Uh, presently, I am the director of the Des Moines Civil and Human Rights Commission. Uh, I have a bachelor's in business uh, administration, business management, I have a law degree in corporate law. Um, I have a master's in business, and I've um, worked internationally, I've lived internationally, and I was civil rights attorney for the state of South Carolina, and presently I'm the director of the Des Moines Civil and Human Rights Commission here in Des Moines. I, I have no Iowa connection other than my job. Now, so how did I get from here All right, so I guess the question is, so how did I get from here to there? And if you really want to understand how I got from this kid out of South Carolina to there, you really have to look at the space in between, because it's the space in between that tells the story. The space in between talks about how I transitioned from that kid to being a civil human rights director. Now we talked about my degrees. My degrees are in business. So my question to you, am I doing biz am I am I doing business work right now? No, I'm not. I'm the civil human rights director. That's not technically business, although I'm involved with businesses who may discriminate against people. That is not my work. So we're gonna talk about, I want you to understand the transition. And, I, and, the, and to make that transition, I went off the grid, went off script, and followed my own path. Now, I've done a lot of things in life, but there is nothing that has quite shaped me such as this experience right here. And that experience is Colombia. I lived there for two years exactly. It was originally scheduled to only stay six months, but I didn't buy a return ticket, so I just kind of figured it out as I went along the way. Now, some of you may know Colombia from Pablo Escobar. Maybe, maybe you've seen Narcos. Uh, you may even heard about cocaine. Oh, they got good cocaine there. And if you follow the news, you may know about the Garija, the FARC there. Um, but you know, there are other things about Colombia too, uh, especially if, if you, know, you may have known about the coffee, Juan Valdez coffee. Uh, which is actually very good. I never really even liked coffee until I left the country. Uh, it tastes much better there. It's so burnt here. I don't know if you, anybody agree with me on that. Is the coffee here just burnt? It doesn't have, yeah. Um, or you may know somebody whose hips don't lie. So, but Colombia is so much more than that. Uh, Colombia is the only country in South America that has a coastline on both the Pacific coast and the Caribbean. Uh, it is the second most biodiverse country in the world. It has the most butterflies, the most species of amphibians, as well as birds. It's also has, it produces the most emeralds in the world. But Colombia is much more than that. Colombia is a place that really helped me find my way. Because if I was being honest, once upon a time, I was just a lost soul. Uh, if anybody who's from the United States, you know, there, there, there's a road map they give you. They say first you go to school, then you do what? Get a, get a job. And then after you get a job, you're supposed to do what? Get married. Get married. And after you get married, you're supposed to do what? Have a kid. Like you have a kid and buy a house. That's the American script. Then you do what? Work till you're 65, then you retire, and then you may get no social security and then die. You, know, you, might even get, you might even make it that far. I mean, that, that's the American script. And I have to be honest, if I'm being complete, I, I didn't buy into that script. And so when I was getting my MBA, I, had a, I went to, my MBA program requires you to do international uh, immersion. So a friend of mine invited me to go to Chile. I was like, all right, well, let's go. Uh, well, no, we did a study in Chile. We did a study, international immersion in Chile. 
And when I went to Chile, my friend from Chile is like, man, when you go to Chile, man, the first thing you're going to see is people in the park making out all day. I'm like, really? As soon as we got, I'm like, damn, they are making out. This is a nice life. All right. There's every people just in the park, hanging out, having fun. And that week was just very good for me. That was my first time traveling international. About a month later, we had to do a volunteer experience. And a friend of mine said, hey, man, let's go to Colombia. I just went to Chile. I was like, oh, that's pretty nice. Let's go. And when I went to Colombia, um, if I'm being honest, they were some of the poorest people I had met, the people, the people I interacted with, but they were some of the happiest souls I'd ever seen in my life. Because again, following the roadmap of the United States, if you're poor, what are you supposed to be? Miserable, depressed. But there, people were sitting on one rollerblade rolling down concrete hills. I was like, this is awesome. So I said when I was there that week, I said, I gotta come back and figure out what the magic is of this place. And so I graduated from the MBA program and one of the professors that I volunteered with while we were in Columbia called me up and like, hey man, you should come back. I got a contract for you. And I was like, well, you know, I'm looking for jobs now and I'm having interviews and let me work for two or three years and then I'll come, then I'll come there. And he said, come on, man. You know, once you start working, you'll never come here. I was like, you're right, let's just do it. And I did it and I went, took a trip, um, and it's really helped shape me. If, uh, here's some just quick things. Uh, this is me as a professor uh, at the university with my, some of my students right there in the top left. This is me. I started a volunteer program working in the, the, the mountains teaching uh, kids English. Uh, but then we went there and realized they needed much more than English. So we helped build roads. We helped install lights in their homes. Uh, if you don't know anything about Columbia, most of the, 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 the better off people uh, except for one group, which I'll talk about later. They live in the valley, and the, and, and the, the soil is so tough that they put the poor people in, in the mountain around the city, for the most part. It's not all true. I learned how to, I, I learned uh, salsa, and, but the beauty of Colombia is really its people. Um, that's what I fell in love with. These were some of the nicest people that I ever met in my life, and they really helped shape me, shape who I am. You know, even while I was there, I was able to uh, it, you know, visit beautiful lands. I was, I was able to learn how to, I was just dancing all the time. I even got to express my frustration to the police without getting my ass kicked. So there, there was a, so there was a lot of stuff that was going on there. I also ate a lot of food. I mean, I ate a lot of food. I ate so much food that I even bought home a chef souvenir that I can't easily get rid of. So, uh, yeah, that's my wife. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I, I want y'all to do an exercise with me, just one more exercise. I want you to close your eyes just real quick. And I want you to focus on the famous words of this great philosopher. And she said, do you know where you're going to? Do you like the things that life is showing you? Do you know? Open your eyes. That great philosopher was Diana Ross, by the way. Um, <laughs> you know who that is. But anyway, if you don't know where you're going, if you feel confused, my advice for you is to get lost. Get lost, and sometimes that'll help you find your way. As I stated before, when I went to Colombia, I bought a one-way ticket. Uh, part, part of that was because I owed so many student loans, I really couldn't afford to get another ticket. But uh, it was cheaper to get a one-way. I said, I'll figure out my way on the way back. So I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. I had a contract for six months, but every six months I re-upped, I re-upped, I re-upped. And as I was working at a university there. Now, Despite the norms here in the United States involving the education process and the script that we just walked through about what do you do, go to school, get a job, you know, there's so many people that feel lost. This generation, the millennial generation, which I, I kind of a part of, uh, many of those people say that they are frustrated, they feel like they want to do something that's meaningful, they want to do meaningful work, and many of them feel alone and lost in the process. And one of those reasons is because people confuse academics and education. So what do I mean? Education is something that you want to learn. 
something that can help you build skills and evolve in the world. It is the pursuit of knowledge. There's a difference between that and academics. Academics is a set curriculum with a structure. It is a system that is used to measure how much you learned in the classroom, how much you memorized. That is not the same as education. Education can be found anywhere, any place. Just an interaction between two people can be an education for someone. You can gain new knowledge from people, places, entertainment, experiences. Academic condition you for a reward, whether it be a good grade or college, scholarship, et cetera. Academics is a way to measure how well you were able to retain knowledge and then regurgitate it back on paper. How many of you have ever taken a test or ever took a class, you take a test and then forget everything after the test? I see some people shaking. Yeah, I, the, thank you, honest person. I appreciate that. I don't know, I, I remember everything I ever learned in school. <laughs> it's not true. Now, school itself is fo focused mostly on academics. You learn something when it's time to ace the test, but as I just mentioned, you'll likely forget it. Education is a growing process. Education is bigger than a piece of paper. One of the biggest problems or biggest fallacies that we have in education is we think we become a master or a doctor at something. We don't need to learn anything anymore. You can learn something from a three-year-old if you open your mind to it. So once you learn something, it becomes knowledge. And knowledge is the key to changing the world. There's a statement by Damian Marley, knowledge is the key and it will set the people free. I firmly believe in that. Knowledge is power. Academics is compliance. So don't stop your education with just a piece of paper. Because there's a great big world out there just waiting to be explored. So today, I'm going to talk about that big world out there that some people cling on to, that I clinged on to. Because if I'm being honest, you know, when I was in school, I was not a scholar. I have all these degrees, which means I have a lot of student loan debt. But at the same time, when I graduated from high school, I graduated with a 2.3 GPA. But the problem was I kept testing well. Every year, I, I wasn't really into academics. I felt confined, I felt restrained. But they always put me in the college prep and advanced prep courses because when I took a test, oh, you're really smart. You need to apply yourself more and throw me back in there. When I went to college, my first two years of college, anybody want to take a stab at what my GPA was? Oh, that's uh, first semester. <laughs> 1.7, not no 1.7. <laughs> but your high school GPA is supposed to be an indicator of, uh, of future success in college. So anybody want to take a stab at what my GPA was in college my first two semesters? No, it, your, your high school GPA is an indicator. They use that as an indicator for college. So anybody take a stab? That's a real, that's a softball question. That's the one question students, ooh, 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 let me get that one so they don't call on me no more. <laughs> so, 2.3, that's exactly what I had. Now, I, I upped that 1.7 because I actually liked school. I was partying. I was like, dude, if I want to keep partying, I got to at least have a 2.0. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I, I focused after I got that warning and, and after my first semester. However, life, if you pay attention to it, gives you something called moments of awakening. Moments where if you don't right your ship, you're going down a bad path. And you know, I got a few moments of awakening in college. Uh, you know, I'm gonna keep it PG, but you know, one of the moments of awakening is enough to change any guy's mind. Like, you know, get that message from a girl, you know, I think I wanna be a lawyer now. What, I'm talking to you about having a kid. No, I think I wanna be a lawyer. <laughs> so, um, and so those things can warp you and change you. But today I'm also going to talk about other people. I'm going to talk about my experience, but I'm going to focus on other people who use international experience and inter international education and international interaction to take them higher. So, can anybody spot, anybody know who the person is dead center in the middle towards the back? Other than the people who, yeah, you, you don't count, so. <laughs> anybody know who that is? 
dead center back. All right. Anybody want a hint before I tell you who it is? No, not yet. All right. So that is a president of the United States. That is Lyndon Baines Johnson, the president of the 60s. He was the president that took spot after Kennedy was assassinated. He was the vice president, Kennedy was assassinated. Now, this is him in Cotula, Texas. And Cotula, Texas is on the border of Mexico and Texas. He went down there and became the principal after his freshman year in college uh, at, at a school that was comprised mostly of Mexican immigrants and first generation Mexican Americans in a small farming and ranch community on the border. Now, anybody know what LBJ is famous for other than the Vietnam War? So I would not have my job except for the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Lyndon Johnson was the one who made it illegal for employers and landlords to discriminate on the basis of race, sex, color, creed, religion, national origin, with the pushing of other civil rights leaders. Uh, one will, we'll talk about at least two of them today. So this president was the one who made it probable for all of us to sit in this room right now. So you got to understand that. Now, his experience was shaped by teaching and being a principal on the border. And he said, he also signed the Higher Education Act of 1965, which again made it possible for all of us to sit in this room here today. Now, the, the, the Higher Education Act of 1965 increased federal monies given to universities, created scholarships, and gave low-interest loans for students. And on the day he signed that, he came back to Texas and signed the bill in Texas at his alma mater. And he spoke about his experience as the principal here in Cotula, in, in, in Cotula Texas. He said, I shall never forget the faces of the boys and girls in that little Mexican school. And I yet remember the pain of realizing and knowing that college was practically closed to practically every one of these children because they were too poor. And I think it was then that I made up my mind that this nation could never rest while the door of knowledge was closed to any American. And he got that from working with immigrant Mexicans and first-generation Mexican-Americans on the border of Texas and Mexico. He used his experience and bought it back so that we could sit here in this room right here today and learn from one another and try different kind of foods from different, from different countries. So I want to understand, when, I want you to understand that when you're going through life, don't just walk with blinders on. Absorb everything around you because you can actually make a change. Now, I guess everybody knows who that is. I don't have to guess who that is, right? If, if you're a human being, you could guess who this is, correct? And he, he has a day in January and a whole month in February. So, <laughs> so, so anybody, everybody know who this is, right? Okay, yeah, Dr. Martin Luther King, all right. That's the one black history group. Martin Luther King, right? Right? <laughs> all right. Now, Martin Luther King stood for what? Civil rights, Civil rights nonviolence. Now, where did he learn that? He learned it, first of all, Martin Luther King had a PhD, and he studied Gandhi's practice of nonviolence when Gandhi was fighting against British, uh, the, the British when, when they had colonized India. And he did the Montgomery bus boycott, which took place in 1955. Who started the Montgomery bus boycott? It's the other black history quiz question. The other person they all only talk about. Yeah, I heard it, Rosa Parks, yes. Yeah, that's, that's it, now, now name anybody else that's black. Oh, Obama, Obama, right? <laughs> so, all right. So, in that Montgomery bus boycott, the thing you have to understand is it lasted for a whole year, 382 days where they 
Instead, they did nonviolent protests where they refused to ride the bus until they were treated as human beings. Now, he learned that from Gandhi. Gandhi's first protest was the salt protest where they walked and carried their own salt back to the cities of India. Now, after the Montgomery bus boycott ended in 1956, in 1959, he spent five weeks in India. Gandhi had already passed. But he said, India is the land where the techniques of nonviolent social change were developed that my people used in Montgomery, Alabama. And while he was there, he said that they were looked upon, him and his wife, that's Coretta, were looked upon as, as brothers and sisters of the same kin of the same struggle. And he said, since India, I am more convinced than ever that the method of nonviolent resistance is the most potent weapon available to oppress people in their struggle for justice and human dignity. So he took nonviolence from a tactic after his, after his visit to India to a principle. It became part of his core. Now, if anybody knows the life and legacy of Martin Luther King, you know, I know y'all know I have a dream speech, but that was 1963. King lived another five years after the I have a dream speech. And he wasn't always the most popular person. Now we celebrate his life, but in 1967, he took a protest against the war in Vietnam run by Johnson, the person we just talked about prior to. And people said, King, that's not your lane. Stay in your lane. You should be focused on civil rights and black people. And he said, I stand for the rights of all people. And I cannot sit idly by uh, while we spend billions of dollars on a war against the Viet Cong who have never done anything against me. And while we're sending black persons who are continually being discriminated against here in this country to fight a war against people who've never done anything. And he stood up against nonviolence. He stood for nonviolence for the rest of his life, even when he became persona non grata. Him and Johnson were very close, but after he protested against the war in Vietnam, his invitation to the White House was closed. And he sacrificed his life to that principle. And we are impacted by him sitting in this room today because of that. Now, anybody know who this is? A million dollars, whoever, I don't have a million dollars. So, uh, <laughs> all right. This is the father of public education. His name is Horace Mann. Horace Mann was the one who, once again, helped us all be in this room here today. I understand these are people who have impacted our lives. Horace Mann was known as the father of public education. He called education the great equalizer. Education, he thought, he thought the wheel was out of balance, and this was during the Industrial Revolution, and that education was not preparing us for the current challenges. And he stated, a man is guilty of the wrong which he could have prevented, but did not, as for that which his own hand has perpetuated. They then, who knowingly withhold sustenance from a newborn child and he dies, are guilty of infanticide. And by the same reason, they who refuse to enlighten the intellect of the rising generation are guilty of degrading the human race. So how did, what was his impact? What, how did international experience and international education impact him and lift us all higher? In 1843, he went to Prussia to visit the schooling system there, where he learned of the Prussian education model. And under this model, schools were established, supported, and administered by a central authority, superintendent, and the state supervised the training of teachers, attendance was compulsory, and parents were punished for withholding their children from school and from education. This model that he brought back to the United States helped create local school systems and the school district in which we all operate under, where you had a centralized town or city authority, a county authority, and they followed and they followed suit under a state guideline and ultimately a federal guideline of education. So again, he left the country, he interacted, traveled, 
saw what other countries were doing, and came back and brought that model to us. Now another person, go back a little further in time. Everybody know who this is? Thomas Jefferson, all right. Now, Thomas Jefferson served as the French ambassador from 1784 to 1789 before he became president. This was after the writing of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, but he served as the French ambassador. And while he was in France, one of the things he encountered was a number of homeless people. And he was appalled by what he saw. And he wrote a letter to James Madison, and he said, whenever there is in any country uncultivated lands and unemployed poor, it is clear that the laws of property have been so far extended as to violate natural right. And he thought everyone had a right to land, except for people that look like me. And every, <laughs> just say, that's the contradiction of Jefferson. That's the contradiction of Jefferson. Everybody had a right to land. White people had a right to land, let me be correct. And that if the government was not giving them that opportunity, then he even said, every rebellion every now and then is a little good. And when he became president in the 1800s, one of the things he strived for, you remember they bought this land that we sit on right now, although it was owned by, although it was occupied by indigenous people, he bought it from uh, France while he was president so he could establish more land for white people. One reason why the Midwest is so white, and I'm being dead serious, is because of Jefferson and Lincoln. Now, those two people really played a role in expanding the European reach of the United States. Now, everybody know who this is? Third question on the black history quiz. Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass. all right, all right. So Y'all doing good on the black history quizzes today. Yeah. <laughs> so. Now, Frederick Douglass was originally enslaved. He was not a slave, he was enslaved. You can't, people are not born slave, they are enslaved by other people. And during this time as a slave, he got a glimpse of education and knew that he had to be free. And he had the fortunate, he was fortunate enough where he wasn't a deep south slave, he was a Maryland slave. And when Maryland's right there on that border, the Mason-Dixon, and he was able to get over to the other side and become free eventually. However, Frederick Douglass wrote a book about himself called The Narrative of Frederick Douglass, which is a great book, short book. You can read it in a night or two days if you so choose. And he started, because people didn't believe, he started going around speaking, and people said there's no way that a black person could be this articulate. I've gotten that before in my life. Um, and so he wrote a book having to prove and name names. You know, he, he had to snitch on himself in order to prove how intelligent he was. Now eventually, because he did that, this was still, slavery was still legal, his previous enslavers tried to get him back. So he had to leave the country. And in 1845, he set sail for England and before the, sh before the trip had even begun, he met with pro-slavery uh, persons who argued against his passage towards England, encountered him on the boat. But once he got to England, he said this. He knew for the first time what it was to be truly free because England had abolished slavery years before. And he knew then and there that he had to go back and fight for his people to get this feeling of what it meant to be a human being. He said, it is clear that slavery in our country can only be abolished by creating a public opinion favorable to its abolition, and this can only be done by enlightening the public mind, by exposing the character of slavery and enforcing the great principles of justice and humanity against it. And he did this by going out and speaking all around England for about a year. And he knew that he could move freely without restriction, dining with the upper class, and visiting with houses of parliament in England as a, as a freed African person. And he said, I have to go back and do this for my people. And he went back, 
and he kept giving speeches, and he uh, had a newspaper called the North Star, speaking out on the ills of slavery. He said, what does uh, the 4th of July mean to a slave? And kept pushing and prodding. One of the key things that he did was he kept trying to get Lincoln to allow newly freed Africans to fight in the Civil War. So one of the things that you may not know is, at first it was just white on white uh, war. And, they would, and both sides refused to allow blacks to serve. Frederick Douglass went to the White House and said, Lincoln, you have to let us fight. And when Lincoln let us fight, he, 187,000 Africans joined, many of them formerly enslaved, and the war ended within nine months. So it wasn't the United States that freed us, we freed ourselves, because they had been going on war for about three and a half years with no real movement. It was a give and take. War of attrition kept going back and forth. But once we got the chance to fight, we were freed. And Frederick Douglass really pushed for that. And he lived another 30 years after the Civil War, speaking on the rights of Africans. Now, last question in the Black History Quiz. Everybody know who this is? Who, who is that? Malcolm X, all right. Everybody know who the lady he's talking to in the photo? Maya Angelou, all right. Somebody got 100 on the Black History Quiz today. Y'all didn't even know y'all was getting that. <laughs> all right. Now, I'm going to focus on Malcolm, but I will talk about Maya for just a moment. Now, Malcolm X gets a bad rap here in the United States for the most part. I always say they whitewash King and they blackwash Malcolm. And the reason why he gets a bad rap is because most people are not educated to his complete life. The problem with most people is that most people try to lock you in time. You know, my mother still thinks I'm 16. Uh, and I'm 22 years older than 16 now, to catch my age. Like, I remember, yeah, you always, that. Mama, I hadn't done that since I was 15 years old. You know, most people try to trap you in a time where they remember you. You know, even if you have a caught up with an ex. Oh, do you remember when we used to? Girl, you know, I don't do that no more. <laughs> so, some of y'all are like, yeah, girl, let's, let's try to rekindle that flame. Oh, girl, I'm out. All right, so, all right. Malcolm X is one of those people where we try to lock him in time. So I'm going to give you just a little bit more about Malcolm Shabazz. Now, Malcolm X was known for being a member of the Nation of Islam, and he came to the public light in a 1959 special, uh, The Hate That Hate Produced, where they finally showca showcased what the nation of Islam was, and he was one of the prominent faces in that. And one of the things they say is that he hated white people. He called white people the devil. And at one time, he did say the white man was the devil. But again, there is a difference between uh, knowledge and indoctrination. He was indoctored into the nation of Islam now, he was with the Nation of Islam for probably about from, from, 19, from the 1950s to 1964. 1964, 19, late 1963, he was suspended from the Nation of Islam, and eventually uh, he finally completely broke off from the Nation of Islam. And after that, he took what is called a Hajj to Mecca. And during this Hajj to Mecca, he encountered Muslims of all colors, from all parts of the country. And he recognized that, okay, maybe what they've been telling me isn't true. Maybe the white man isn't the devil. And he began not to look at all white people, painting them with a broad brush, but instead of looking at them for the content of their character. He said, during his Hajj, there were tens of thousands of pilgrims from all over the world. They were of all colors, from blue-eyed blondes to black-skinned Africans. But all were participating in the same ritual, displaying a spirit of unity and a brotherhood that my experiences in America had never led me to believe could be possible, that could never exist between white and non-white. And after that, he saw and began to speak, and he said, I am not a racist. In the past, I had permitted myself to be used to make sweeping indictments 
of all white people, the entire white race, and these generalizations could have caused injury to some whites who, per who perhaps did not deserve to be hurt. Because of the spiritual enlightenment, which, was, which I was blessed to receive as a result of my pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca, I see my brothers as red, yellow, black, white, of any color. If you're willing to fight with me against the injustices of, human of this society, then you are my brother. And again, he spent the next 11 months trying to write and take back some of the things and rebuild relationships that he had broken through his words for the next 11 months of his life until he was tragically assassinated in February of 1965. These persons all took their experiences and didn't just use it for themselves, but they use it to not, they use it not just to lift themselves up, to go back and help others. From Lyndon Baines Johnson passing the Rights Act that allowed us to be here today, from Martin Luther King who went to India and learned how to use nonviolence as a principle where he tried to teach people to take the higher road, knowing that the moral arc of the universe is long but it bends towards justice, to Horace Mann who helped establish the education system that we're a part of today, to Frederick Douglass, who used his experience in England to know what it was like to be free and instead of staying in England and said, I'm going back to the United States to help free the rest of my people because he knew that none of us are free until all of us are free. To Malcolm X, who for years had been indoctrinated to believe that persons of a different skin color of his were his enemy, and it was once he traveled and left the country and went off to Africa and to Mecca, learned that not all persons who have treated me wrong in the past deserve to, all persons don't deserve, all persons who look like persons who treated me wrong in the past do not deserve to be painted with a broad brush. So, let's bring it back to me. Now, how did my international uh, experience and education uh, influence me? Now, I don't know if you noticed something in the earlier pictures I showed you about my experience in Colombia, including my wife. But a lot of those people were what? It's OK, you can say it. Not just not white, they were what? I asked about, yeah, I like, they were of African descent. They, had, they, they were of African descent. Some of those people look just like me. Now, one of the things you have to understand in life, most people believe that life revolves around them. And it wasn't until Copernicus that he recognized, yo, the sun doesn't revolve around the earth. The earth revolves around the sun. Now, Copernicus was scared to publish that and waited to publish it until he died. And Aristotle was the one who actually published the papers and he was excommunicated and put under house arrest by the Catholic Church for the rest of his life because of his belief. He said, no, Catholic Church, we got this all wrong. Now, most people believe that 80% of the things that happen to them, everyone else should feel. But that experience taught me because, again, you know, I, I, I am a product of public schools. And I, had a, I went to all public universities, yes, and we talked about the African-American or, or African experience from the American lens. But the majority of black persons and persons of African descent that went through the African Holocaust actually went to Brazil and Colombia, South America. And if you understand anything about Latino, Latino is not actually a race in itself. It's a mix of persons from three parts of the world. That is, you know, conquistador, which is Spanish and uh, Portuguese, persons from West Africa, and indigenous persons that used to occupy these lands. And some of those people still look just like me. And I learned, you know, when I first saw black people, I said, like, hey, black people, que? Que esta diciendo? Oh, la. Necesito aprender español. Because when I first went to Colombia, I forgot to tell y'all, I didn't speak Spanish. 
I actually only spoke English. All I knew was hola como estas and pollo por favor, <laughs> which means I was eating chicken for the first six months that I was in. Pollo por favor means chicken. So, you know, when I was first there, you know, I, I, I didn't know how, I only knew how to say pollo. So one time they was like, ¿Quieres hígado? I was like, yeah, yeah, si, sí, si, sí, si. Sí. I didn't know what it was. Oh, liver, no, damn. I don't like that. Pollo, I'll stick with pollo. And so, I learned, especially from this gentleman, this was my taxi driver for like almost two, the whole two years I was there. His name is Henry Escobar. And I learned so much about their experience. And if you know anything about Latin America, typically the darker your skin, the poorer you are. But guess what, that's also true. The United States of America. And I recognized that I could not live a life just solely revolved around me. And so what I did was say, I was going to take back the things that I learned, the experiences I have, and try to either stay here in improved conditions, and I say here at Columbia, or go back to the United States. And I decided to do just like Douglas and say, you know, I'm going to go back and try to improve the conditions here in my, in, in my state, I, I started out as a civil rights attorney in the state of South Carolina. Because if you remember, I had three business degrees, but I'm not doing business now. So what I did was have to recognize who am I really? Let me get off this script that they put me on and try to figure out who I am. So the thing I tried to do was identify what are my talents? What are my passions? And how can I get paid to do that? That's the win in the middle, and that's what everybody needs to strive for, especially my students here. And if you're ever confused about what your talents and your passions are, I'll give you a quick quiz. A passion is something that actually gets you excited, something you really love. So by a show of hands, how many of y'all really love music? Show of hands. All right, now keep those hands up. Don't keep them up, keep them up real quick. Now out of those people who raised their hand, how many of y'all can actually sing? All right, see, exactly. So you're passionate about music, but music is not your talent. But you can still do something in music even if it's not sing. You can be a producer. You can learn how to make beats. You can learn how to be the executive. You can be the a and &R. You can be part of the street team. There's so many things you can do revolving your passion, not just the main thing. Now, your talent is what you're actually good at. What are you good at? And so what I had to do and what Columbia helped me do, Columbia actually had about three jobs. I actually practiced corporate law while I was in Columbia. I worked at uh, uh, Corn Products International. I was a professor of business and law. And I also helped start a foundation that I talked about earlier. While I was there, I really helped find myself. I learned that, yeah, I could do law. I was actually good at law. I was practicing law before I left the country. Uh, my cousin, uh, who was a judge said, man, you're really good at this, but you don't have the heart for this. Because being a lawyer is really cutthroat. And if you are nice and you believe in just being honest, you probably ain't gonna last very long. <laughs> just being honest for anybody thinking about law. So, I, I reflected back, and any time you're ever confused about what you wanna do, I always tell people to do this. Go back to the time when you were being not you were being graded on how well you learned rather than graded on how well you got the, how, how well you picked it up. You know, your first, up till fourth grade, they're teaching you how to learn, and then, you, and then after fourth grade, you're really having to spit back what you learned. So the first, from zero to fifth grade, I really liked to write. I really loved history, in particular black history. And um, I like to do things like this. And so I took, my passion, which was history, with my talent, speaking and being very analytical, one of my skills is to take something that's bad and make it better, or something that's doing okay and make it even better, and decided to get paid for that. And so one of the things I did was I started doing civil rights law, first as an attorney and now as a director. And I just didn't accept the role that was handed to me. Civil rights has evolved over time. Nobody's just yelling, nigger, nigger, that doesn't happen anymore. Most people, most, uh, racism is very covert rather than overt. So what I did was I didn't just accept my position, but I knew I had to change policy. 
I knew I had to change practices. So one of the things that we've done over the past year is we've made it illegal to discriminate against people who have uh, government housing funds, Section 8 funds. Because now they, they say, oh, we don't accept Section 8, which is code for we don't accept black people. But they can't say, oh, we just, but Section 8 fund is just government money. Do you accept dollars? Yeah, that's government. Yeah, you, you have to learn how to evolve. We've made it where all city employees have to get cultural competency training to learn empathy, how to walk in the shoes of others. We've made it where the city actually invests in various companies that are trying to address social economic barriers that prevent people that look like me and other persons from moving up the social economic ladder. And I took my talents and passions to do that, and I get paid for it. Now, so if you're ever confused, sometimes you gotta step outside the noise and get lost. But in today's age, it's so easy to get caught up in technology that you forget to experience the world. You experience it more on television and on the phone rather than live and in person and then looking at the time wondering where did the time go? Now this is my best friend and his wife so don't tell him I posted this. So I really encourage you to take advantage of your youth because for me, I didn't travel internationally until I was 29 years old. I waited, I should have done it 10 years early. Most people do that gap year. Some people do that gap year in between high school and college, but it wasn't until I was 29. But there's a saying that you can start too late, but you can never start too soon. And I really believe in that. So if you're ever confused, I do tell you to get lost. But when you go, don't just go for that obligatory selfie. Look at me, I'm helping these poor black kids, yay. I'm helping these poor Latinos, all these are poor. No, don't go for the selfie. But also, don't go to places that separate you from real life and real experiences, you know. I have friends that go to, ah, I've been to Jamaica. I'm like, where'd you go? Sandals? Well, you didn't go to Jamaica, you went to Sandals. You need to go back and actually experience the people that actually live there and are going through the struggle. Because if you truly embrace the experience, you create bonds that can really not be broken through years. And it can transform you and give you clarity and give you purpose. And it can also make you more enlightened. <laughs> Making you ready to give back to the world. So you don't have to walk the path that so many others have taken. You can follow your own script, go off the beaten path, take the path less traveled. There is another way. And if you only get your education and your schooling in classroom, you're selling yourself short. There's a great big world out there. And you can't let your schooling get away of your education. So I want you to take advantage of the opportunities that are given to you right here, right now, to experience something great. They have something on Tuesday where they're talking about the European tour. I encourage you to take advantage of that. They have the Costa Rica tour. I know they've gotten a lot of bad rap lately, but that was only eight people. Don't worry about that. But, uh, go and take advantage of that. Because when you take advantages of the opportunities, I promise you, when you die, you don't think about, and I know this because I've had people in my, in my life who've left me. You don't want to think about, oh, I wish I would have worked harder. I truly believe that. That's why next year I might quit my job. I'm being dead serious. <laughs> I want to go out and experience the world because there's a great big world out there. So I really encourage all of you to get lost and find yourself. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I know Joshua didn't get to try any of the treats yet, so he needs to do that. And there's lots of stuff left back there yet, so enjoy yourselves. Thanks. Thank you.